I think innovation is part of the human condition. It's who we are. We can debate for a long time about whether individuals are able to innovate. I believe strongly they are, but people have disagreeing views on this topic. Try a simple experiment next time you're around a child. Give her a pile of blocks and don't do anything. See what happens. I guarantee somebody that tall can innovate. We're here today for um, a, a full day-long event of stories, of inspiration, of discussions. 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, 30,000 years ago, our ancestors did the same. They did the same because they were able to control fire. Right? They were able to control their environment. We just heard about iPhones. I can pull out a smartphone now and control the temperature of my house or this room in one degree increments. Right? We as a culture have innovated. And every culture around the world does innovate. I live and work in Silicon Valley, as you heard. Silicon Valley is one of the modern hubs of innovation. Not the only one to be sure, but certainly one of them. There in the valley, we have an ingrained culture. Right? And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that culture and give you a few examples of what we're up to. A couple of things are important in this culture of innovation. One is the ability for teams to move. Teams can cross boundaries. Teams can work and cross-pollinate within companies and amongst other companies. The ability to move is critically important for teams and innovation. We'll come back to that topic. Teams also have the ability to recover from near failure. I've chose those words carefully, near failure. We tend to view success and failure as binary. Either we succeed or we fail. Reality is, especially when you're working on complicated things, there's in-between states. I'd like to talk about that as well. But first, the topic of teams moving. Silicon Valley was built by people. Silicon Valley is the northern part of California, the California Bay Area. There are many synonymous terms for this part of the world. Uh, if you go back to the history of Silicon Valley, it was fruit orchards. Right? It was the agricultural capital of Northern California. But why, why do we use Silicon Valley as synonymous with technology now? It means something different to us today. Certainly it's not um, the canning of fruit. It's because people from Fairchild Semiconductor left and formed other companies. When they formed other companies, they took with them ideas, they took with them colleagues. Those companies were called Intel and AMD and Hewlett Packard and a bunch of others. That's, in Silicon Valley terms, ancient history now. <laughs> what's happening now is people that started their careers at Google and Apple have gone on to form other companies. Right. We're right at the cusp of employees of Alibaba and Baidu and Tencent leaving those companies and forming really interesting new ventures. The mobility of teams is critically important. Innovation is a process. We often call things innovative. A smartphone, a thermostat, a new website, a new social enterprise. We often call them innovative. But let's define innovation as a process. There's a big difference between what is innovative and how we innovate. I care a lot about the second. To care about the first is great, but that mixes up the outcome and the process. So let's care about how we innovate. If we view innovation as a process, the temptation is to become prescriptive. If I do X thing, if I set up my office to look like Google's, I will be innovative. You should try that. If I brainstorm in Y way, I will be innovative. Certainly there are linear innovation processes. Certainly there are reductionist innovation processes. Certainly these are elements of things that help become innovative. But that's not it. We foster an ecosystem. We foster a community. We do the things that we do that make us human. That's what allows us to be innovative. My teammates and I work on hundreds of new technologies. What's worked for us is exactly this, cultivating an ecosystem.
In my work, I get exposed often to companies, to regions, to local governments, and even national governments that want to increase their innovation potential. They come to us and say, we would like to be the next Silicon Valley. I have my own opinions about that topic. Silicon Valley is good at some things, not good at many other things. Um, every other region in the world has their own unique offerings. Um, copy and paste rarely works well. But nonetheless, people come to us and say, we want to be innovative. And we say, OK, let's try that out. Often these approaches are top down. It's often the CEO of a company, the head of a division, the government official that's in a position of power. These are often the people that say, we will be innovative. The future of our economy depends on this. Creating new products and services is what will turn the ship around. We will be innovative. Often the second reaction is quite simple. They do one of three things. They form incubators, sometimes locally, sometimes housed in Silicon Valley. They offer courses on innovation, and they run business plan, entrepreneurship, or innovation competitions. They're all kind of the same thing. They do those three things, and they do it over and over and over again. And it's certainly happened here in Hong Kong, it's happened in, in, on the mainland, it's happened all over the US, and it's happened around the world. I've been involved in all three of these things, all three classes of these things, and so I'm equally to blame. I'm not gonna stand on stage and point fingers to somebody else. This is something I've been intimately involved with. The problem is that most of the time these things don't work. Because what we're doing is crossing outcome and process. If the goal we agreed is to spread innovation, then why do we hand literally a big check to one team and say congratulations, you're the winners? You say congratulations to one team when your goal should have been to spread innovation tools and techniques, approaches and ideas across a wide number of teams. I think we should do better. Let's take an example. Let's imagine a few of us get together and to tackle a hard problem. It could be improving the quality of water. It could be making our airport safer. It could be novel medical devices. We'd likely gather, have a meeting in person, I hope, assign some roles, and go off to the races. We'd start working, we'd start doing things. Maybe we'd study the market, maybe we'd build a prototype, maybe we'd interview a bunch of people. All of those are great things. Whether the project as a whole is a spectacular success, a horrible failure, or the most likely outcome, somewhere in between, all of us involved in that will have learned. We will have learned how to work with each other, we will have learned how to create something new. That knowledge stays with teams, and it stays with individuals. Our shared experiences are critically important in spreading a culture of innovation. So we said we'd form this team. Often when an innovation challenge is issued, we look inwards. Who on my staff can I get to work on this problem? Who can I convince to work with me on this problem? Who can I assign this to? Whose job is this? All of those are inward looking questions within our own organizations, within our own companies, within our own universities. We must be deliberate in creating teams that are much, much wider than this. Inward focused teams are rarely disruptive. At Triple Ring, our private R&D lab where we work, we have 130 scientists and engineers, business experts, um, social scientists. Th th this mix is really incredible. Often when we get started on a big project, we involve the government, academia, and other parties. I guarantee each of those people I just mentioned, each of these types, speaks different languages, has different motivations, is incentivized by different things, views success differently. But when you get all these people to work together, as hard as it is, magic happens. So it'll be hard to see this, but this is an x-ray tube. It's about the size of a big grain of rice. If I shake this tube, you can see it rattling around in there. This is a cancer therapy device. If somebody has cancer, sometimes you put a radiologic substance in the cancer in the hopes of killing it, right? Dealing with radiologic samples is dangerous. It poses national security threats and has other major issues associated with this. This is something we worked on. 
Uh, things like this don't come from small inward looking teams. Broad collaborative teams, right? If the government and the regulators were, involved, were not involved, this would have no chance of success. If academia were involved, this would have no chance of adoption. Big teams. So when I expound this type of um, encouragement for collaboration, I often get the same reaction. A need for secrecy, a fear for theft. If I share my idea, somebody will take it and will beat me. They will beat me to the market, they will beat me to success, they will take all the credit, they'll become famous. We have kind of base human desires that get in the way of that. But I believe our ideas get a lot stronger when we talk about them. The, the discussion of ideas is what propels them much, much further. Sitting alone in a lab is not a good way to be an inventor. Working in the middle of a community is a great way to be an inventor. So people tend to be very protective of their ideas. A, a quick story, if I may. Uh, I once had the privilege of teaching 80 graduate students. They were assembled in a classroom. They were broken into innovation teams. Each team had a challenge that they were tackling. Maybe our early examples of water quality or airport security. They had a few hours, and their assignment was to come up with a hundred concepts to solve that challenge. How do we make drinking water safer? And imagine four or five people, they go to the corner of the room, they start filling out post-it notes and putting it on the wall. At the end of a few hours, there were 2,000 ideas on the wall. Just a few hours. So then I thought I'd try something. We had a nice discussion about the process and how it worked. I walked over and without reading the post-it note, I pulled one off the wall. I held it up in front of the class and I said, how much would you pay me for this? You can guess what the answer was. Close to zero. Unanimous, 80 students, 80 graduate students don't agree on anything. 80 graduate students agreed that that one post-it note wasn't worth much. And the reason was there were 1,999 on the wall to take its place. Right. Ideas are almost free. The execution of ideas, the hard work, the de-risking of concepts, the building of prototypes, the putting the ideas into action, those create tremendous value. The ideas are free or cheap. As we allow people to move, as we challenge them, our collective ability to innovate increases. Our practices, our tools and techniques are honed as people do it more. Skills are powerful. When you're in a position to lead a team or issue an innovation challenge, pick the hardest one you can. The hardest one you can. Disruptive innovation rarely comes from easy challenges. We should not view success as 100% of the time I do well with easy challenges. We should view success as the ability to adapt. If things aren't going as well as we planned, we should be able to change to improve them. That's what we should strive as individual innovators, but also as a society to establish new norms. Safety is not innovation. Innovation requires bravery. We're sometimes fearful of our careers, of our reputations. If we change a social norm to that of adaptability, we can no, no longer be fearful of those individual consequences for innovation. So picking a big challenge is a little bit like picking a big rock and throwing it into a pond. You get pretty big ripples, bigger ripples than if you toss a tiny stone into that same pond. But that's not enough. Big challenges are absolutely not enough. And we have to define our community very broadly. If we define our community as our teammates, our classmates in a university, our fellow professors, our colleagues in a company, we will not succeed as much as if we build very strong innovation teams that cross boundaries, cross seams, cross disciplines. When we do this, we, not just, we don't end up with just a ripple in a pond, but we also end up with waves in an ocean. Thank you.